this is such an important topic, um, particularly for uh, women, but also for men. But I notice a lot of women have trouble delegating. And I think that has to do with um, the uh, expectations that we put on ourselves, but also the societal expectations of how to be a mom, how to work, how to, um, you know, uh, be a productive, um, you know, employee or employer. Joanne, where are you from that it's negative one? Uh, Glenn is from Beloit. I'm sure it's colder there. Amanda, perfection is what takes so much of your time. I hear you. Michelle, it's two degrees here in Minnesota. Okay, you win. That's colder. Natasha from London and Tia from Australia. It's so great to have all of you. Thanks for coming. Well, I thought we would start today by asking ourselves a question. What is delegation? So I looked it up in the dictionary. I like to do that. You know that. And what the definition of delegation, of delegate, delegate, the verb, is give authority, entrust, and empower. And I thought those were such great um, answers. I want to break them down a little bit. So giving authority, when we delegate, we give someone authority uh, to do something, but we also give ourselves authority to be able to trust someone to try something. So we're both entrusting so, um, which is the next verb, someone else. But we're giving ourselves authority to be able to let, to let go of something and we're giving someone um, a, authority to do something. This means that we entrust them with a project, which means that we will have to trust ourselves to believe that we've described what we're doing efficiently, that the person can, ha, 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 can complete the thing that we're asking, has the capability to do it, and that we have faith in the relationship that we have and in the process. And the last verb was empower. And I like this because the empowerment goes both ways. It goes towards the other person because they're feeling good about being asked to do something. But we ourselves are empowered because we are actually saying, you know what, I have confidence that it's okay to let this go and for me to focus on something else. So I see the comments are coming through like wildfire. So let's go back a bit. So we have a couple of weather things. Thank you, everybody. Diane, wherever you are, wow, that sounds cold. And uh, oh, that and another Diane says it's negative 15 in Ottawa. Oof. Joanne, wind chill is negative 20 in Maine. Yep, I haven't looked at the wind chill. It freaks me out a bit, but I'm sure it's not so great here, but probably warmer than that. Hi, Cassandra. Uh, hi, Fiona. Hi, uh, Kristen. Hi, Pam from New Zealand. Serafina says, a favorite quote of mine, there's a big difference between being boss and being bossy. Oh, I love that quote. That's fantastic. It is exactly what we're going to be talking about today. Veronica says, you're on their way to reasonable temperatures in the Netherlands. It was nine degrees centigrade today. Oh, that sounds pretty good. Hi, Stephanie from the Redwood Coast and Sarah. I feel for me, delegation can sometimes feel like losing control and it disempowers me, um, but I do try to entrust others and let go. It works when I'm in a calm mindset and I have shed my perfectionism skin a little bit. I completely agree. Thank you for sharing. Um, this is recorded, you uh, Nakamura, so you'll be fine. Hi, Anna from Montreal. It's negative 40. Oh my gosh. Um, we're doing a whole weather thing here. It's fantastic. MJ, 64 in South Texas. Whoa, that sounds awesome. I could ride my bike. Um, thank you, um, you Nakamura. Uh, Joanne, I have a friend who's offered to help me. I don't know where to start. And Amanda says, the problem here, too many people delegate too, delegate too much to me. I see, so the demands become overwhelming. So that's the flip side of delegation, which is you're being in, entrusted to do too much. Now, I'd like to go back to something that um, Sarah said, that sometimes delegation can feel like losing control and feeling disempowered. So in order to do this, we have to actually check our own perfectionism at the door. And we also have to be able to stay in that, you know, really centered mindset that things are going to work out okay. And I don't have to be on every single thing to make sure it works out okay. 
there's a great quote from, um, I think it's the best Marigold Hotel something, I forget the name of the movie, but the quote is, everything works out in the end, and if it hasn't worked out, we're not at the end. Um, and I like that because it's not that everything works out beautiful and happy. It's the things resolve. And so we have to have some faith in the process and in our ability to both give tasks to other people, but also to set limits about tasks that people are giving to us. Cassandra says, delegation requires a level of humility, um, but also acceptance that you can't do it all. I've gotten better about it, and it started when I became radically accepting of what I'm capable and not capable of doing. Yes, that's fantastic. And this is a great point, Cassandra, because a lot of us have a hard time assessing you know, what we're actually capable of and not capable of. I have this issue. Um, I always think I can do more in a given amount of time than I actually can. I say yes to too many things and then I feel tired and burnt out because I'm not good at setting limits and also because I don't like saying no. I don't know about you, but how many of you, you know, have trouble saying no? I think a lot of women, and particularly with neurodiverse women, struggle with that. And that has to do with, our, you know, a history of, of wanting to please people, of feeling like, you know, we don't want to, you know, want to make another mistake that you didn't see coming, these kinds of things. Hi, Crystal. Um, it's a struggle to get your thoughts out clear enough to delegate them, so I tend to get frustrated and just take back the control and do it myself and get overwhelmed. Um, yes, I can write the Marigold uh, Hotel quote. Um, let's see. Um, everything works. I think this is where it's from, but don't hold me to it because I could be wrong. It might be from somewhere else. And if I'm wrong out there, please correct me. Uh, in fact, right now, I'm just going to check because I'm worried that I am wrong and then I'm spreading wrongness <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> ah, I'm wrong. There you go. It's from Tracy McMillan. And it's from her book, I Love You and I'm Leaving Anyway. So please forgive me, Tracy McMillan. Um, uh, I'm glad that I caught my own mistake. Everything works out in the end. If it hasn't worked out, it's not at the end. Tracy McMillan, I love you and I'm leaving anyway. And I'm leaving you anyway. So I'm going to put that down here as the source of that quote. So... I apologize. I thought I heard something like that in that movie, but I could be wrong. I'm obviously wrong. So, um, let's see. Uh, okay. So, this idea that you can't get your thoughts out clear enough to delegate your expectations has to do with the, the, the challenge of prioritizing when you have a lot to do and the overwhelm that you're feeling. Excuse me, I'm just going to put my heater on one second. Um, I realized that it was getting dangerously cold in this room with many windows, so thank you for that. Um, so, um, so one of the things that happens is that we go into overwhelm freeze. There's so much to do. We don't know where to get started. Everything seems urgent and important. And, and then we're stuck because we actually need help figuring out what is the important thing that we want to pay attention to. Um, and yes, Sandy, with your disabilities, um, that can be hard. Thank you, Attitude. Karen, I have a hard time just staying focused in one room. I walk out of the room and then something else I'm doing. Uh, and I walk out, she's something else, and all of a sudden I'm doing something else. Every day is a waste. Why can't I focus? So a lot of people with ADHD struggle with that, you know, drifting focus. In fact, you know, one of the, you know, m kind of traits of ADHD is inconsistency, you know, inconsistency in self-regulation, inconsistency in self-awareness, inconsistency in motivation. And that inconsistency is, is problematic for so many adults and gets in the way of, of people being able to perform at their best and use their skills. 
Glenn, I'm passively delegated to at my job. That sounds super annoying. Um, BTW. I've been there for a year and a half and I do the same thing every day. Some days I delegate some of my tasks to coworkers if they have time to help me. I'm a prep cook. Yeah, so you are you are delegation central. People will give things to you and then your job is to prepare them and sometimes you can uh, help with others. Um, so thank you. Uh, Dana, it's hard for me to delegate because I have a hard time explaining what I'd like someone to do the way I'd like it done. Plus, if it's not done correctly the way I want, I feel like I get I have to do it over and I get upset. So this, I think, is true for a lot of people. This actually happens for me sometimes as well. So um, I think it's whether or not people have ADHD, uh, when they want to get something done a particular way, and this is where our perfectionism comes in, um, they, it's harder to delegate it, it's harder to pass it off, and then you want to check and see what people did and then correct it so that it looks like something that you feel good about. And I think that one of the challenges is that um, if we're going to delegate something, then we have to figure out what is our role in terms of supervising it. Um, I, I, one thing that I think can be helpful in terms of explaining what you want is rather than talking what you want, to write it in an email. And you can, um, you know, with, uh, with your computer, you can get a dictation program, or if you have a Mac, you can set it up so you can dictate. And then you can, you know, just l say your thoughts about what you're trying to get them to do take a quick edit of that and then send it. And that, I think, will help people who feel like it's all kind of in their brain but they can't get it out. Um, so, uh, let's see. Terry McMillan, I love you and I'm leaving anyway. Yes. Oh, excellent, Monica. You're welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Amanda. <laughs> Thank you, Crystal. Gabor Mate says that illness stems not from not saying no when you need to. Every day we should ask ourselves, when should I have said no today? Yes, I'm Julie. Thank you. That's a really great question. I mean, you know, Gabor Mate is a wise man. And, you know, the, the, the thing is, you know, particularly women, and this has to do with our, our psychology and our development about you know, we are raised to, con to define ourselves through our connections with others, which lead us to saying yes to things more than to say no. We don't want to um, upset people. Uh, we don't generally want to um, rock the boat. Um, and we don't want to disappoint people. Aha, David, thank you. I have not lost my mind. You Thank you for putting a link to the clip in the chat. Okay, so we have Terry McMillan and the Best Ever Marigold Hotel. Woo! Everything is good. Thank you, David. Um, Tanya, um, I seem to have two issues with delegation. The first is things don't get done correctly. And second, I also I have the issue with explaining where something is or how to do it. Something st stuck finding my words so I find out it's just easier for me to do it. Right, and so what I really want to encourage you to start doing is dictating, you know, or typing, or somehow getting the thought out of your head. Because ideally, if you're trying to do all of these things yourself, you're not going to do it, and you're going to be burnt out and stressed. And we want to reduce our stress, and instead what we want to do is improve our ability to ask for help and delegate. You know, a lot of people with complex ADHD, and when I say complex, I mean ADHD that travels with anxiety, depression, um, uh, learning disability, autism spectrum, um, twice exceptionality, bipolar, uh, um, bipolar disorder, um, or oppositionality, uh, substance abuse, you name it. All of this is what complex ADHD is. And it's difficult to ask for help because it's uncomfortable. A, you might feel stupid. B, you might be afraid of looking weak. C, you may feel vulnerable. Uh, and D, you may feel ashamed that you actually need to ask for help, that somehow other people are able to do all of this together, but you are not. Um, many adults either refuse to ask for help, reject it when it's offered, or pretend that they've got things covered when they don't. Of course, kids do this too. 
And when adults with ADHD are overwhelmed, it's harder to ask for help because you just aren't sure which thing to focus on and give to someone else. So there's a sense of flooding by the work or the tasks. They all seem big, they may all seem important, and you may go into overwhelm freeze where you're just like, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to give away, I'm just stuck. Okay, so asking for help relies on several things. Being comfortable with not knowing. And this would mean um, being comfortable with things not being perfect according to your standards as well. That's the next thing, accepting that perfectionism doesn't exist. So you're comfortable with not knowing, you accept that perfection doesn't exist, you accurately assess your own personal strengths and weaknesses, you accurately assess the strengths and weaknesses of the person you're delegating to, and you understand that learning happens through trial and error experiences. You may delegate to someone and it may work out. You may delegate to someone and it may not work out. You know, is, there a, is that a life or death situation or can you adjust it? So I see so many comments here, I'm gonna to try to respond to them. Robin says, make a list, highlight it as you complete it. I've had ADHD before there was a name for it. Thank you, Robin. If they have, find what works for you and use it consistently. Agreed. Um, radically accepting is golden. Sometimes you feel like you're spinning your wheels. Yes, and I think in those moments when we're spinning our wheels, we actually have to get out of the car. We have to get out of the car and walk around the block or walk around the car or take, I'm sorry, I have something in my eye, uh, or take a break so that we can zoom out a little bit because when we, can, we feel like we're spinning our wheels, we are stuck in it and we can't get, we, we need perspective. And so the way that you're gonna get perspective is to step out and do, take a body break to clear your head and then come back and take a look at it. Monica, I struggle with prioritizing in a big way. Delegating in a professional setting comes down to recognizing other strengths and weaknesses. Right, so we want to delegate something that maybe is harder for us to someone for whom it's easy, right? We want to, we don't want to delegate something that's hard for us to someone who has the same struggle because then it's not going to be effective or efficient. Cassandra, perfect is the enemy of good. I have learned to be okay with good enough. Anything done better than nothing being done is even if it's done by someone else. Right. So what Cassandra's saying is um, something being done, something getting done is better than not doing something at all. Um, Jennifer, I don't want to upset, disappoint other people. Too many demands. So when there are too many demands on your time, I think it's important to think about what are your goals? What do you, what do you, what is most important for you? Um, again, that zooming out can be very helpful because you're in the weeds and you can't figure out which is the, you know, which direction to go or what's the thing to pay attention to. Um, Jennifer says, I often say no and ask for more information before saying yes. That is fantastic. You know, my dad does that. I remember one year, um, I live in Massachusetts and we had tickets to take our kids to go see Hairspray the Musical so I'm dating myself and my husband got sick and I called up my dad who lives in Philadelphia and I was like hey dad we have an extra ticket for Hairspray why don't you come up and meet us for the day in New York you know I mean the two grandchildren I'm like thinking he would just love to do that right away and he says well I don't know let me think about it and he got, I hung up the phone and I was like, why can't you just say yes? And um, then he called me back, you know, literally three minutes later. And he said, I talked to my wife and it's fine. I'll be take, I'll meet you at such and such. I said, great, I'll make a reservation for lunch. Um, so we want to respect that some people need some time to think about a request um, before answering. And if you are feeling overwhelmed, then I bet you need a little more time to think about the request. 
oh, I believe that men have issues saying no to Dana. No, no, don't worry. Their issues are different a lot of times than ours. I think that men have issues saying no um, because they um, feel a pressure, a certain pressure to provide, a certain uh, pressure to fulfill certain ideals of masculinity. I can do everything. I've got this under control. Um, you know, I manage everything when actually they might need to ask for help. And that definitely would fly in the face of cultural definitions of masculinity because it would assume that you're weak. Veronica, the fear of disappointing people is a huge thing. And on, and on the same side, wanting to help people as much as possible. I get that. You know, that's very, I really do. I feel that. And it's something that operates for me. Serafina, do the most unpleasant or hardest task first to get it out of the way. Then you will feel good about accomplishing something difficult and build on that feeling throughout the day. That is a great point, although sometimes, Serafina, some people like to do something easy to warm up, and then they tackle the harder thing, because they kind of need to get in a flow, and then they tackle the harder thing, and then, um, that they, then they can go on to something medium. Uh, let's see. Uh, Glenn, um, thank you for sharing. Veronica, unwritten expectations are the norm working in academia. I think um, I think that's absolutely true. You know, the sort of publish or perish or whatever um, your job is. Um, but there are expectations really everywhere for everybody, and sometimes those expectations are not. Um, spoken clearly or um, laid out, and that can be difficult for people who struggle with social anxiety or reading uh, per interpersonal cues. What do you do when you get shamed for asking for help and literally have no so source of support? Well, first of all, Kai, I'm sending you a big hug because I feel sad to read this. Um, you have our community here. We are a source of support for you. Um, what kind of help would you like to ask for? Um, because if I had a sense of what that was, I might be able to direct you in a different, um, in, into a different, a different um, arena. Excuse me. Expectations. The ADD shutdown. Very familiar. Yep, that's that overwhelm freeze. Um, Sandy, yes, the circles I'm in seems are seemingly full of highly capable people. It sometimes gets me down. I work on not comparing myself to others for better health. Yes, we don't want to get into the compare and despair, and a lot of us do that. And and not just you know not I mean everybody I think, and that's why social media is so popular because everyone's looking at everybody else, right? Um, what does the shutdown feel like to you? Is that are you asking me that question? Um, or do you want to ask our peers? So what do our peer, you, what do all you have to say about what the over, overwhelm freeze shuts, feels like to you? So for me, the overwhelm freeze, is like, freeze, freeze, the overwhelm freeze feels like my brain is like going to explode. And I have to do a couple different things. Um, sometimes I just need to lie down on the, gra on the, on the rug and breathe. Um, sometimes I need to go outside. Uh, sometimes I can just make myself a cup of tea and look at a magazine, but I need to get myself away from the thing that's overwhelming me because I feel like I can't think. Like my there's like a, you know, uh, a um, uh, what do I want to call it? An, um, a vice on my head. Um, Kara, for me, I don't like to ask for help because many times uh, others aren't reliable or to, to, to even do what I asked. So we want to be selective about who we ask for help from and somebody we can depend on. And, and I think that, um, that, that we want to start by asking for small things because we don't want to be disappointed right? Because then we're not going to ask for help again. So we want to start by asking for something small or delegating something small. See how that goes and then come back. So what counts more than perfection is progress. Perfection is impossible to achieve and if that's your goal it's going to be really easy to freeze up out of fear of not achieving it. Instead focus on smaller reasonable goals that you can actually meet and that you can give to other people, right? Making some amount of progress on a task is always better 
than striving for a perfection and getting nothing done. Thank you, Monica. Susan, I've trained others so that if they will, if they don't do an assignment, I will, or if they don't do it well, I will. Perfectionism and control, probably. You know, we 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 basically tell pe we we model for people. Oh, if you don't do it, I'll do it because I I want it to get done. And if you you know do it, I'll still look at it to see if it's done the way I want it to be done. It's hard to let go of that, but at some level we have to decide what are some things that we can release and let someone do and however they're done um, I'll accept it I mean you're gonna you're gonna review it anyway if you're a supervisor but you know to sort of let it go out there a little with a little bit more trust and free and 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 hope that um, it becomes what you want it to um, Okay, so Cassandra says, research uh, the effects of perimenopause and menopause on ADHD symptoms. As estrogen drops, it will get harder, but I've heard it does get better at some point. There are minerals for our brains. Attitude has articles on this, I'm sure. Yes, it does. It has many. And what I will say is going through perimenopause to menopause is the hardest part, but once you sort of settle into menopause, you, you know, things even out. Um... Uh, let's see, what do you do when you say yes and then later realize you wanted to say no and hold back in fear of hurting someone's feelings, suffering in silence? Crystal, that's a great question. And I think one of the things that we want to do is to give ourselves a little more space to reflect on something before we say yes, right? So if, buy yourself some time and then if you say yes and you realize you've made a mistake, you can go back and you can say, you know what, I think I am overcommitted. I'm going to have to withdraw from this commitment. I know that's disappointing, but here is someone, blah, 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 who could do it. Uh, Monica, I always need time to decide. It can lead to social angst and rejection sensitivity dysphoria. Yes, because people don't understand it. But I think the thing is that if you ask for time and you come back, like you ask for a certain amount of time and then you come back to it, you should feel fine, like you're free and clear. You ask for something and you're returning. Um, stuck in Marcia. Karen, thank you so much for all your help. Is there a book I can read up on this? How can I help myself? Um, and there's a lot on me because I don't ask anyone for help. I'm just appointed in myself. Again, thank you. You're welcome. So uh, Karen, as a matter of fact, I wrote my blog this week on this exact subject on how to ask for help and delegate. So please go to my website. I also have a downloadable, which I have, for, have not um, put out to all of you. Um, so let me get to that. And it is on... Um, it's a little bit on why multitasking doesn't work and how to create productive routines while living with ADHD. So uh, I've just put that in the comments. Um, let me say a few more things. So um, there are things that interfere with delegation um, and there are some tools that we can use to overcome them. So the first thing is a lack of clarity. So if you're generally confused about what to do and what would be useful and you're feeling that overwhelm freeze, um, it's tough to prioritize. And so, you know, people may reject offers of, for assistance because they're unable to process anything else in that moment. They're like, no, stop, it's too much, right? So if um, what you want to do instead is to break things down, do that brain dump of um, all what you're thinking about then you know, ask someone to help you prioritize, to highlight it, uh, highlight those top things in yellow, make a smaller list with the top three things that you need to get done, and then take those top three things and see, hmm, what are these three top three things? What are some of the components of those? Who could help me with that, okay? So um, when you can name the task, decide what is needed for the task, understand when it's due, it's easier to ask for assistance from an ally. So you can separate your big brain dump into, into categories by subject, by deadline, by complexity, and then break those down into smaller pieces. 
Um, another thing that interferes with asking for help or delegating is discomfort with, with vulnerability. And this is for all of us, men, women, children. Um, most adults um, don't like being vulnerable, and it's especially tough for people with ADHD. You've probably spent years hearing about how you've missed the mark at school, at work, at, at extracurriculars, in relationships, at home. So you might believe that you will inevitably mess up again. You might not trust your ability to respond appropriately and believe that asking for help demonstrates further weakness. I'd like you to reframe your vulnerability as a strength. It takes courage to be accountable for your limitations and stay open to assistance. Just today, in this Facebook Live, you helped me. I realized that I think I made a mistake. I wasn't sure about that quote. I looked it up. I gave you the correction. And then I think it was David who actually told me, no, I, it was from that movie. And it's in both places. So, you know, you helped me. And the thing is, I had to be vulnerable because I had to realize, you know what? I think I might have made a mistake. And to share that instead of pretending like I know it all, which I don't. Um, and you were all kind. You were kind. So we want to assume that people would prefer um, to be kind rather than being nasty. And people who are nasty are just disconnected and you don't need that kind of toxic energy in your life. So instead of seeing help as a manifestation of weakness, focus on the strength in authenticity and knowing when you can't do it alone. I do this work because I believe in being authentic and in helping people to, to discover, develop, and share their authentic selves in the world. Um, asking for help is part of that process. You can't do it alone. So let's look at a couple of comments. Wow, there are 44 comments. There's no way I'm going to get to all of these. All right, Jenny, I'm a registered nurse, and Monday through Friday, the charge nurse. Wow, God bless you. Thank you. I'm so overwhelmed, a huge portion of my day, by a huge portion of your day, and feel like I'm shutting down more often lately. So, Jenny, if you're the charge nurse, I'm going to ask you, you know, what are the things that absolutely are within your purview, and what are the things that someone else could take care of and report back to you? I also want to make sure that you really take your breaks when you get them. And if that means going to the cafeteria, if that means leaving the hospital and sitting in your car and listening to some music, whatever it is, you may want to make sure that you are actually giving your brain a break, a rest. The shutdown feels like paralysis, LaDonna says. Thank you, LaDonna. I cannot do anything all at all once I become completely overwhelmed. So that's part of that sort of overwhelm freeze. You know, you're just, you know, there is that shutdown and you can't do anything. When you're feeling that shutdown, the first thing you need to do is leave the room that you are in. Whatever room you are in, wherever you are, you need to excuse yourself and go somewhere else. If you're in a meeting, go to the bathroom. If you're uh, in your house, in your office, you're, or you're on your computer, close your computer and go into a different room. Change your location. Um, for those of us who raise children, we would always, you know, when kids are crying, there were sort of four things that we would look at. One, were they hungry? Two, were they tired? Three, did they have a messy diaper? And four, do they need a change of environment? You know, so when I happen to be with my grandson and he's crying, I might just take him into a different room and look around or step outside if it's not negative 12 degrees or whatever. You understand what I'm coming from. The shutdown happens to me a lot, Veronica says, because it's like there's a minimum number. Ugh. All right, Monica, send it again. Sorry. Um, Cassandra, I cannot focus on even the smallest task. Even showering feels like way too much. I don't sleep well, and sleep is what I need to function. Everybody does. Uh, everything feels loud in my brain, and nothing can turn it down. I have to take time to reset my brain by breathing or walking or finding something I can do and finish quickly and feel the dopamine from that. That usually helps. 
Sometimes it takes a couple of days to break out of the paralysis. Thank you for sharing. So yes, you want to maybe, if you're feeling overwhelmed that you're getting nothing done, find a task that you can do and complete it so you feel like, okay, something has happened. Dana, this is what troubles me. Help nowadays is sure. I'll email you a slide. Everything is technology. No more interpersonal person health, and that's how I function best, not with 30,000 emails. Oh, yeah, me too. Um, so, yeah, the email thing is crazy, and they pile up, and they're overwhelming. And so one of the ways that I try to manage my email is to basically set 30 minutes in the morning and I go through my email and then I try really hard not to look at it every hour on the hour but to come back to it uh, maybe at lunch for 30 minutes and then at the end of my day and I'm not great at that because I will look at my email throughout the day because I hate having it be so many emails um, but we the, the goal is to really sort of chip at it um, uh, you know, t you know, in time chunks. Maybe 30 minutes is too long. Maybe it's um, 15 minutes. You can use your time timer. Hello, love this, love this, to help you. Um, I have that now. Feel pressure in my head, brain fried, even eyes blurry after being uh, eye doctor. The eye doctor Tylenol doesn't touch. Body feels rigid tight, stressed, I walk, yeah. So we want to actually, it, you know, what happens is your brain is in an amygdala takeover when you are in a freeze, because it's fight, flight, or freeze. So the freeze is that shutdown. It's, it's a very sort of young uh, way, you know, psychologically, it's a, a way that we developed when we were young to cope with things. Um, and so what we want to do is to try to, you know, slow down the stimulation and shift our um, our location. So um, uh, Bob says, great discussion. I think I read way too many superhero books. I read way too many superhero books and those stories, no matter how hard things got, the hero would always find the inner strength to prevail. Uh, it's not the way how the, the way the world works. I tend to hunker down in my bunker and try to tough it out alone. You know, toughing it out alone is just hurting you. It's, it's, it, we've got to communicate, we've got to lean on each other. So let's look at something else that I think contributes to this tough it out alone, not asking for help thing, and that is being overwhelmed by shame. So many neurodiverse kids and adults, particularly adults, and if you are diagnosed later in life, um, especially this might have to do with you, live with a deep-seated shame about being different about having messed up, about making mistakes. We, are, we don't practice forgiveness with ourselves. We're mad at ourselves. We're mad at others who've hurt us. Um, and so whether we have this shame that is visible or it's hidden, you may not see successes um, that you actually accomplish. Or you may deem your successes as short-lived or as lucky and, not, and believe that you don't deserve help or that it won't make a difference, or that you yourself really don't have influence over the things in your lives when you really do. Um, Ellie, age 27, tells me, I'm embarrassed that I can't do it alone, that I have a disability. Well, people who don't have disabilities also have to ask for help. Um, I have, uh, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a community here, um, uh, as, as some of you may know, um, uh, in Northampton, and um, one of our community was very sick with COVID, and her husband was sick with COVID, and she reached out uh, um, at the synagogue and said, I need help. Um, could someone bring some meat? Could we, you know, I need some meals. We can't, we can't do this. And, you know, she, does, she doesn't have ADHD, you know, she doesn't have a disability, she just couldn't do it. You know, you're sick, you're home, your, husband, your partner's sick, or you live by yourself and you're sick. This is when we want to ask for help, and it's appropriate um, to do it, and it doesn't mean that there, we need to be ashamed of that. So these internalized negative messages that you've received over time about doing things, that you need to do things better, um, you need to do them differently, you should, you're smart, why can't you, you know, figure this out? These intensify your belief in the likelihood that you're gonna either fail again at some point and asking for help is something to be ashamed of. So um, actually asking for help 
is not a reflection of failure, but it's an act of resilience. It's an act of resilience because you're, you're actually bouncing back by taking a, a realistic view of what's happening around you and what you need to get through. So this means that you're going to change your expectations for yourself. The pressure to measure up and be perfect is so intense for us today, especially with social media making comparisons day and night. So sometimes asking for a help, asking for help can seem like opening a door to an avalanche of disappointment that you'd rather avoid. You disappointing others, others being disappointed in you, you feeling disappointed by others. So instead, you're just going to wrestle with things on your own, your perfectionism, or giving up, or praying for a miracle. So the most important thing to do is to pick yourself up, to really evaluate what's going on, and make different choices as you learn from your experience. This is where our metacognitive abilities, um, which we have as adults, really can serve us, okay? So we want to stop worrying about disappointment and pivot to what's needed for optimum productivity and best performance. Ask yourself, are my re expectations of myself realistic? Are my expectations of the people who work for me or I supervise realistic? Create goals that are within reach and emphasize the process of doing something, that efforting, rather than just the product. Um, you may not be able to do it alone. Most of us can't, so that's okay. Who is one person who can assist you? One. You want to start with one? and delegate something small to them so that you can build some trust that they'll actually follow through. All right, let's go back to some of the comments. There are 69 comments, which is incredible. Um, and um, let's see what some of the questions are. It doesn't occur to me to ask for help when I'm in that shutdown state. So thank you, Julie, for saying that. So here's the thing. Let it occur to you. I am helping bring awareness to you right now to light up your metacognitive ability, that self-awareness, that self-evaluation to say, when you're in a shutdown mode, ask for help. Who do you want on your speed dial that you can call when you're in a shutdown mode? What are an activities? Have shutdown mode as a note on your phone and people to call, uh, self-soothing activities, options other options that you might need so that you can actually do them. It's hard um, to delegate to trust others. I'm afraid, also afraid I'll forget something and not be clear. So one way that you can handle this, es Esther, is to either, you know, what I talked about earlier, write it down, dictate it, review it. Then, if you're, and then you can ask the person if they would send you back an email confirming what you're asking them to do. And that can be in conversation as well. You speak something, you ask them to you know, confirm what they've, they've heard you ask for, and then you'll know if they've heard you and you've communicated clearly. Um, yes, your comment, Veronica, got deleted while I was reading it. I'm very sorry. Um, uh, when I talk to my counselor, I'm all over the place. Sometimes I think it's hard for her to keep up. That might be true, and you might want to ask her. You know, and you might want to say, if I'm switching topics too quickly, can you help, um, you know, corral the horses here <laughs> so that we're only focusing on one thing at a time, and then I will know that we're going to come to the next thing. Like, do you need to write them down? What will help you? Um, yes, things are chaotic. Transcendental meditation can be very helpful. Emma, I had a breakdown and walked out of my operations manager job due to these issues. Just put my keys on the desk and left. How are you doing now, Emma? Are things better for you? Um, was it the right choice to leave? Have you found something that suits you better? Sometimes jobs just don't fit who you are, and it takes a while to figure out what they are. Shed the shame. Couldn't agree more, Cassandra. It's what frees you. Your brain is different, and it's okay. It doesn't define your character or your worth. Yep. Okay. I understand. Barbara says, I understand that. All someone has to do 
has to say to me is, I have this great idea and my brain takes off. Um, we could do this or that or this other thing, and I'll think about it for hours and then get exhausted. Uh, Veronica, if you'd put your comment back up, I really would like to, to read it. So you're welcome, Julie. Esther, yes. This video is always available afterwards. I know that you keep getting knocked off. I'm sorry. Here's my downloadable for you. Please check out my most recent blog as well. Um, let's see, Stacy, my ADHD was diagnosed at 48 after some serious health issues. My coping fell apart. I don't feel like you've gotten your legs under me. Um, that's great that you're getting extra evaluations and more support. Containment from your therapist. Tonya, I consistently ask for help, but the people I ask do not follow through. Then I get resentful and stop asking, get overwhelmed and shut down. I'm told you should have just asked for help. So I would encourage you all to assess who you're asking help from and what you're asking them to do and if they have the capacity to do it. Because we want to make sure we ask for help on specific things that A, we can't, we don't do very well, we don't like doing, and B, that whoever we ask can do them better than we can or can do them well enough and, um, and be of assistance. Okay, Emma, I'm better three years later. I'm now off work permanently, but my mental health is so much better. You're learning to function. I'm so glad. You're welcome, Sandy. Again, I'm just going to wait one minute to see if Veronica wants to repost. Barbara, um, okay. Let's see if there's anybody else I've missed. I can't see a lot of things. Veronica, can you repost? Um, let's see. Okay. All right. Uh, Monica, I had a hard time teaching during the pandemic, dealing with the constant change in expectations. I eventually left because I had no one to care for my son who has autism. It was a dark place. I can imagine it was. Yes, Dana, sometimes depression takes over. There's a kind of hopelessness and helplessness that, that, that kind of that, that creeps up. Um, uh, okay, Esther, what I said was... Um, Oh, uh, Esther, let's see, I'm looking, I can't, uh, okay, um, Veronica said, someone once told me that other people are also happy to help as I am to help other people, and that stuck with me, that's right, exactly right, um, okay, um, Stephanie, thank you, Moran, um, Esther, if you watch on the replay, I definitely replied to your comment, if you put it up right now, I'll try it again. Stephanie, sometimes it's so overwhelming that I haven't even known what to ask for. Right. And what I want to say, break it down, break it down, break it down. Do a brain dump, then take a, a one or two items from that list, put it on another list. Break those down. We want things to be smaller. That's what is the antidote to overwhelm. Okay, Veronica, thank you. But essentially, I shut down fairly often because I need a minimum number of commitments to keep from getting bored, and then one more thing is too much. Great. This is actually a great comment that I would love to end on. So what you're saying, Veronica, is that you like stimulation, but what happens is you take on too much stimulation, and then you, you, you have to backpedal or you start to freeze. So what I would encourage you to do is to really think about you know, how much stimulation can you handle at the same time? In the, in the downloadable I gave you about multitasking is a myth. So, you know, lots of people feel like they can do multiple things at the same time. Those things exhaust our brain. So maybe you want to do, um, you want to be working on two projects so you can switch back and forth and you have some music that you're listening to. That might be all your brain can handle. In fact, I think that's plenty for a brain to handle. So, so try to think about doing that. Uh, you're welcome, Moran. The next one is um, next week, and then we'll be off for a couple weeks and then back. You're welcome. Thank you, Monica. Le leave the car when the wheels are spinning. Um, I'm glad you're here. Uh, it's hard to define the help because we don't always need. Yes, you don't always know, Dana. I agree, but you know you need help. And so you can start by, f by making that note. You know, who are the people to call? What are the self-soothing strategies? So that you actually have tools to refer to when you're having a hard time. You may not know the help you need, but if you know you need help, then what that message is is saying, hey, I've got to slow it down. 
um, I want to zoom. I need. I got to slow it down and zoom out. That's what's going to help. Esther. Um, okay, got it. So uh, Esther says it's hard to delegate, um, to trust others, and afraid you'll forget something. So what I said to you, Esther, is that there are two things that you want to do. First, you want to dictate and send things in email form, um, and then ask people to email you back with a summary of what you, the task is that you've asked them. And if you are giving directions verbally, you state what you want them to do and you ask them to summarize to, so you can be sure that they heard what you're saying. All right, well, we are going to stop. Um, the link doesn't work. Okay, that's kind of a bummer. Um, let me try this. Uh, I don't know why the link doesn't work. Hold on. It should work. It worked when I opened it before. So hold on. I'm not sure why it's not working. Um, let me look here. I'm doing it myself now. It works for me. So I'm going to put it back in the chat and hope that it works for you all too. Here we go. There we go. Here is the link again. Thank you so much. Um, thank, yes, Amanda, sometimes you might not be asking the best, the best people or the wrong people, as you say, especially if you ask them before. So we really want to take some time to consider who are people that are worth asking. I'm glad the link at, um, opened for you. This video will be available. Um, please uh, check out my website, www.drsharonceline.com, for more resources on living fully with ADHD. And, you know, um, join me, follow me on Facebook. I'll be your friend forever and very grateful. Instagram, and check out my YouTube videos. Uh, they can be useful as well. Thank you so much for your participation and for attending today. I'm so glad you're here. Um, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. And for those of you in the Arctic blast realm, please stay warm and stay safe. Bye. Take care.